you know, um, what's one of the things that we really need to think about is how we think. How we think. Because there's an old song that says, like, if you're free of mind, your behind will follow. Uh -huh. <laughs> And if there's a truth to that statement, because as a man thinketh, as it says in Proverbs, so is he. If you think that you're victorious, you'll be victorious. If you think you lose, then you'll lose. If you think you're healed, then you'll be healed. If you think you're sick, you will be sick. If you think that you're a victim, you will be a victim. And if you think you're a conqueror, then you will conquer. Amen? Amen. I mean, and listen, if you don't get your mind, get your thoughts in line with your born-again spirit, I promise you that any any difficulty that can possibly come your way will express itself in a magnitude much higher than it normally would have. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Because, again, Your spirit, when you are born again, is perfected. In other words, God sees your born again spirit in the same way that he sees Jesus. In fact, the devil and his demons, when they see your born again spirit, they can't tell the difference from whether it is you or whether it is God. Now, the thing that we run into is that we are a three-part being. Like God is a three-part being. He's Father, He's Son, He's Holy Spirit. We are a spirit with a soul living in a body. We're three parts. Now, Here's the, the bad news. Let's get the bad news out of the way. Is that your flesh will never be born again. Your flesh will not be born again. So, your flesh is still subject to the input that it gets from your five senses. It's subject to the temptations of the world. However, your born again spirit is not. It, again, it's perfected. It's just like Jesus. One third of you is wall to wall Holy Ghost. That's the good news. But here's the thing. What we have to do is we have to get this mind lined up with this born again spirit. Now we've talked about this before that the soul consists of the mind, the will, the intellect, and the emotions. And if you think about that in terms of, of, of Arizona, you would say that uh, that it's you know Phoenix, Flagstaff, Tempe, and um, oh, Gilbert, let's just pick on Gilbert. Or you, let's, whatever. But the point is, is that the first one, the mind, is Phoenix. Phoenix is the capital city. If you want to take down the state of Arizona militarily, you're going to take down the capital. Because if you take down the capital, you cut off the communication to the rest of the state. You cut off the supply lines to the rest of the state. Why? Because the source of everything is the capital city. So if you take down the mind, then you take down the rest of the country. Are you following me? Now, this is why this is important. And the devil his playground, they say the idle mind is the devil's playground. It's the space between your ears, the six inches between your ears, that, that is the greatest battlefield in the history of mankind. 
because you have God who has, has placed his spirit in you and you have the devil trying to operate externally, trying to put pressure on this mind to act in the way of the world. So you have God on the one hand is trying to get you to renew your mind and, and align it with his spirit and the devil trying to get your mind aligned with what he wants you to do. And this is a constant struggle and that's why this scripture, Romans chapter 12 and 2, this is a real cornerstone for you understanding how your mind needs to operate. And it goes like this, and I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after or and adapted to its, its external superficial customs, but be transformed, that is changed, by the entire renewal of your mind, by its ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourself what is the good and the acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good, acceptable, and perfect in his sight for you. Now, I, I, I like to amplify because it, it really expands it, but one of the things that it does not do justice is that it uses the word renewal of your mind, which, it, which signifies a one-time event. But the King James Version says to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ing, anytime you see ing in scripture, is speaking of an iterative process. It's something that you do over and over and over again. It's not something that you do once and you set it and forget it. It's something that you have to do on a regular basis. Just like you can't just take a shower on Monday and say, I'm good till Saturday. <laughs> and then... I, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you something. You know, as is, 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 you know, as as good and nice as some of us are, you know, that that, that just don't hold up. You know, the Bible tells us that we're to, that we're to wash our wash our minds by the by the water of the word. Okay, so when we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds, we're, we renew our minds by spending time in the presence of God in his word, communing with the Holy Spirit in our spirit. We spend time renewing our mind by spending time in prayer. We renew our minds by spending time in fellowship. It, you know, listen, if you, if you hang around, well, let me, let me give you an example. If you work at McDonald's 12 hours a day, every day you're going to come out smelling like french fries. You know, because that is the prevalent thing that is being produced there. So whatever you cozy up to is what you're going to assimilate. So if you're, if you're hanging out with people who have unrenewed, unregenerate minds, that is what you're going to emulate. But if, you, if you're hanging out with people who are also in the process of renewing, your, renewing their minds as you are in the process of renewing your mind, then what's going to happen is that you're going to look like someone who's renewing their mind. If you spend time in the presence of God, you're going to have the fragrance of God. If you spend time in the world, well, you know, they say if you lay down with dogs, you come up with fleas. Bless you. Bless you. So, the thing is, is that how we think, it critically impacts how we act. Because you're not going to, you, you cannot do better until you know better. You're only, gonna, you're only going to operate at the level of your understanding. And so if your understanding is down here, this is where you're going to operate. If your understanding is up here, this is where you're going to operate. So the thing is, what we're doing today is I want to lay down some things that are going to help you liberate your mind. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do in all that we do is to destroy every yoke of bondage that's on the believer's life. Amen? So let's talk about three things. We're going to talk about thinking of God. We're going to talk about thinking of ourselves. And, um, and thinking of others. So thinking of God, thinking of ourselves, and thinking of others. Now, as far as thinking of God goes, probably one of the things that does us the most damage the greatest disservice 
is how we see God. Because if we have a distorted view of God, we're never going to operate as he wants us to operate. And the sad truth is that there are a lot of people that teach that God is angry. God is wrathful. That if you happen to get sideways with God, even though you're born again, you're going to hell. And I bristle at every time somebody says things like that because, first of all, it's not true. If you happen to die in an automobile accident and you're doing 71 miles an hour and the speed limit is 70, you have broken the law. But God is not going to send you to hell because of it. Do you get what I'm saying? You know, there, there have been people who were saved and, and they happened to fall into a fall. I, I, you know, one of the prime examples, Pastor Zachary Timms, young man, mighty man of God had a lot of issues, but you know what? He died in a hotel room in New York City. And they say that they found some illicit drug in his system and on his person. And even though, even he may very well have had this in his system, he may very well have actually done this thing. He may very well have been in a fall, but I'm gonna tell you something, this man led thousands of people to Christ. That he had a mighty ministry and he touched millions of people. And I'm just fully persuaded that that moment of weakness did not damn him to hell. Because if you're born again, listen, like I said, this, this meat bag that we're living in, it, it's, it's subject to our senses. It's like if it's cold, we want to turn up the heat. If it's hot, we want to turn up the air. If, if I'm hungry, I want to feed it. You know, if, if, if <laughs> I want to gratify this flesh. And just because I gratify this flesh does not mean that that damages my salvation. Because if, if that could do it, then that means that the cross is ineffective. Because if you have to do anything to keep it, then that means that what Jesus did was ineffective. Now, am I saying that you're that, that you can that, that there's no way that you can fall out? Well, there is. In, in Hebrews, it says that if you've tasted of the heavenly gift and, and have walked away from it, it says there's no way to restore such a person. You can't deny Christ. You can't lose your salvation, but you can give it away. It can't be taken from you, but you can give it away. You know, it, it, it makes me upset, like when people say, you know, God, God has got his mind made up about who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. I get mad at that because if, if that were the case, then that says that he that that he orchestrated what Adam did in the garden. And if God orchestrated what Adam did in the garden, then that makes God the architect of sin. That's deep, y'all. That's deep. Because the, 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 the truth is, is that if God is the architect of sin and God is the architect of salvation, uh, and, and he's already got his mind made up, then half of us, we really don't have a chance. And then also, it negates something that Jesus said in Matthew 28 to go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. Why go out and make disciples if God has already made up his mind? Likewise, there are some that say, well, God has saved everyone. Everybody's going, everybody's going to heaven. You know, 
And now, I, I believe that if, uh, that yes, even if Adolf Hitler confessed Jesus before he left this earth, that I believe that, that he'll be saved. That's a hard one too. But if he didn't, you know, God isn't just going to see, you, you're, not, you're not going to see Adolf Hitler in heaven unless he was born again. You follow what I'm saying? So, so, so at, at one end of the spectrum where you have these people that say that, that only the elect are going to heaven is wrong, and you have these people that say that everybody's going to heaven, they're just as wrong. There's a choice that has to be made. You know, it, it's like, the, like John 3.16 says that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes denotes an action. Okay? So, you know, the thing is that if we, if we see God as unapproachable, wrathful, judgmental, and we see him that he's, that, that he's going to harm us before he's going to heal us, then, then, you know, we have a distorted image of him. Listen, God is, is out in the world. His spirit goes to and fro in the world and is wooing everyone. Is calling everyone. He's gently speaking to everyone in that still small voice is saying, I love you. I want you with me. I want to be with you. I want to work through you. I want to live in you. He wants to be with everyone. He's wooing everybody. But here I want to tell you is that he will not woo you to wound you. You know, wrong thinking. In the Bible, there is an example of wrong thinking. And it's a guy whose name was Job. And Job was a, a case study in wrong thinking. His wrong thinking got him, caused him to lose everything he had. It caused him to misunderstand God, and then it, 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 called, it, it, it caused him to try to call God on the carpet for what was going on in his life. Job had no revelation of who it was that was afflicting him. And I can prove that. Job chapter one, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. He said, And naked came I into this world from my mother's womb, and naked shall I depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, if I take you back into Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, you will find that the Lord did not take anything. He did not take anything. God gives, period. God gives, period. God does not take anything away. And, and, and here's one of these things about bad theology and a bad understanding of God is they'll say, well, God will take something away from you so that you can have something else. No, God will not take anything from you. What happens is that the enemy, who Jesus said in John 10 and 10, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It is those things that are stolen from you, that are killed in you, that are destroyed in you. That's what God comes to replace with something better. But God doesn't take anything because if God took anything, God then would be a thief. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because you can get this distorted image of what God is, what the, what people, what, what they think God is or what God does. And because of that, they're like, well, why would I want to serve a God like that? You know, it, that's like if, if I gave my kids toys on Christmas and, and uh, gave them like G.I. Joes but demanded that I took the head off each one of them before I, that, that I, that I get it from, uh, from them in order for them to have that. That's crazy. But that's what people teach, you know, like if you don't tie, God will take it from you. You know, God speaks constantly, but Job never understood it. But 
here's the good news. God gave us his Holy Spirit and he gave us his word. He gave us his word in the form of the new covenant. And in the new covenant, God only gives. He gives, he gives, he gives. He heals, he delivers, he saves. Nothing negative. God doesn't take anything. And George Jetson just walked in. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, that just completely threw me off. <laughs> Because I, I love the Jetsons, man. <laughs> so now I've got that. I've got that in my head. Thanks, John. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. Job didn't have a revelation of who his adversary was, but you do. Want proof? John ten and ten. What does it say? That the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What did Jesus say? But I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You know, 1 Peter 5 and 6, it says that, that the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. So you have a revelation of who your enemy is. And, and I'm going to tell you something from a, from a military standpoint, from a warfare standpoint, there's nothing like knowing who your enemy is. Because once you know who your enemy is, you know how to engage him. But see, Job didn't know that. So he all he all he knew is like is God. Yeah. But if you go back to Job chapter one and, and chapter two, you know that there's a conversation going on between the devil and God. And, and let me just say this while while we're here, let me hang my hat there for just a second. I want you to go back and, and look at this at, at your leisure, Job chapter one and chapter two. I want you to read this at your leisure because I want you to understand that God did not allow Satan. Touch Job. He did not allow it. I defy you to find grammatically a permissive clause where God granted permission. If you go back and look at scripture, then whenever God said, Behold, it was usually a statement of fact. So when he said, Behold, all that he has and all that he is is in your hands. He was granted permission. He was stating what the truth was. Because there was no covenant. There was no Jesus. And because of that, the devil did have people in his hand. And he did have the power to afflict. And he did have the power to destroy and, and truth be told, you know, he has the ability to do it now, but he doesn't have the authority. See, there's a difference. Before Jesus, he had, he had, all, he had the authority because man gave him the authority in the garden. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Read it for yourself. So God is a loving father and he's a, he's a great provider. He, he wants to give us things. Uh, you know, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 32, it says, What then shall we say to all this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? I love the word all in scripture because all means all, y'all. It's in all inclusive. It's excluding nothing. It's lacking nothing. All. All things. All things. If he gave you Jesus, Jesus was the, was the greatest thing that he had to give. If he'll give you Jesus and he gave you his Holy Spirit, he will give you everything else. Now that's the image of God that you need to have. You know, I, I, I'm, I think about, you know, Hannah's back there talking to us and, and, and Isaac and, and Robin, 
they love on her and they dote on her and she's got her her beautiful pink, pink dress on and, and her cute little pink shoes and, and, and they, want, they want to give her stuff like that. They want to see her in the best clothes and they want to see her with the best toys and they want to see her in the best health and they want to see her free from any oppression. They want to see her with opportunities. They want to see things like that and they are good parents. But God is better. So if God will allow Isaac and Robin to give Hannah good things, how much more will God give you? The next thing that we need to do is we need to think right about ourselves. We need to think right about ourselves. We have some terrible misperceptions about ourselves. I was in Texas and I was uh, talking to a pastor friend of mine and, and he said, I'm just a worm. And I, and I said, brother, no you're not. Uh, First Corinthians 5 and 21 says that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can't be a worm and righteous at the same time because there's no such thing as a righteous worm. Sorry. Not, I didn't say it. The word says it. And, you know, and I've said this before that if you confess that you are a sinner saved by grace and you say that I'm a saint of God or I'm a son of God, I'm a child of God, and you, you say these things at, in, in the same breath, you're confessing with your own mouth that you're double-minded. Yeah. And, and if you're double-minded, the Bible says that you're, you're unstable in all your ways. And it further says, it says, let not that man think that he's going to receive anything from God. You can't receive because you're not a son. Because when you say, I'm a wretch, I'm a saint, you deny your sonship. And you deny your inheritance. Sorry. So we have to we have to see this. And I'm sorry, that was Second Corinthians five and twenty one, not First Corinthians five and twenty one. But the, uh, the the point that I'm getting at is that it says clearly here that by Jesus in Him we have been made the righteousness of God. So therefore. You're righteous. God sees you as righteous. God sees you as perfect. Because God's not looking at your flesh. He's looking at your born again spirit. It's not, the, it's not the flesh of a man that God's concerned about. He's concerned about your spirit. That's why we have to be born again. Because if you're not born again, you cannot be a citizen of the kingdom of God because you must be born into citizenship. You cannot be, you, you, you can't be an illegal alien. You follow what I'm saying? So, we have to think properly about ourselves. But there's a, there's a, a flip side to that. You can't think that you're so suchy much either. You can't think that you're better than you are. And, and this is where a lot of a, a lot of saints, or, or let me let me coin a phrase here, pseudo saints, uh, get in trouble because they think that because that they spend all their time in church, that makes them righteous or it makes them holy. You know, you're not righteous by being in church any more than by being in a garage makes you a beauty. That's not what makes you whole. Christ and Christ alone. Faith in Him. Receiving Him is the only thing that makes you whole. It's the only thing that makes you righteous. So here's what you know that uh, what the Bible says is uh, in Galatians chapter th uh, chapter six verse three. It says, "For if any person thinks himself to be somebody too important to condescend to shoulder another's load." When he is nobody, 
uh, superiority except in his own estimation, he deceives, deludes, and cheats himself. I'm not just TV ministers. There's a lot of, lot, a lot of local ministers. I mean, and it ain't just ministers. I'm not going to pick on people in the pulpit because there's a lot of folks that, that think like that. They think that because they, you know, uh, I don't cuss, smoke, or chew, or run around with those who do, that I think that I'm better than you. You know, that, that, that because, because I, if, if I'm a woman, that I wear my dress below my knees, that I'm somehow better than you, that I don't wear pants, I'm better than you. Or if I'm a guy that I have short hair or I don't have an earring, that somehow I'm better than you. You know, because I only watch TVM, I'm better than you. It's a lot of folks like that. They, they trump themselves up in their own minds and they think that somehow that because they, they have, listen, the, the Bible says that there are people that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They will sit up and talk about their holiness and they'll sit up and talk about their righteousness and they'll talk about, well, I'm, you know, I'm straight holiness and I preach hell and I'm this and I'm that and I do this and I do that. And then what happens is they sit up and they wonder, why is it that no, why, why are people getting cancer in my church? Why are people dying? Why are marriages breaking up? Why is it that I'm not seeing the power of God expressed in my ministry? I don't understand. And they sit up in the crowd, God, why? Because they have a form of godliness, but they do not, they deny the power thereof. They've trumped themselves up to make themselves something that they're not. They, they've tried to place or, or try to create righteousness that they can earn. Listen, righteousness is a gift. Holiness is a gift. It only comes, holiness is only imparted to you in the new birth, and righteousness is only imputed to you by the blood of Jesus. You can't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to keep it. You can't do anything to, uh, to, to nothing. There is nothing that you can do to earn it, deserve it, or anything, because you don't, and you can't. And yet there are people that think that because I'm, you know, that's just like how Jesus said, he said, there will be many who say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do exploits in your name? And he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, because I knew you not. You can't get to the point where you think that you're so such and much that you're superior to everyone else. I'm here to tell you that that ain't Christ. I mean, we're, we're joint heirs with Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world, in this time, right now. As he is in heaven, so are we in this world. That's right thinking. That's right thinking. Not your own word, not your wretch, not that you're not not that you're holier than thou, but that because he is, I am. And the last thing is that we have to think right about others. Thinking right about others. That goes back to this previous step. Because if you think you're righteous, that you're holy, because you only listen to gospel music, because you only watch the right things on TV, that you only watch the right movies, that you only read the Bible, you don't read magazines, you don't read books, you don't do, you know, you don't read anything outside of the spirit of, of, of quote unquote Christianity, that somehow that makes you better than others, then what happens is, is that you get a distorted image of your neighbor. And here's the thing. That even the atheist, even the Muslim, even the Buddhist is created in the image and the likeness of God. That God wants to reconcile every single 
human being unto him. And if you don't see it like that, then I suggest that you go back to praying, to studying, to talking to somebody, because you better know. Even your enemy, even the person that has done you wrong, even the person that has hurt you, even the person who has stolen from you, even the person who has abused you, that person is a child of God. And until we get a right understanding of our neighbor, y'all, we're still out of balance. You have to see your neighbors as God sees them. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And that's not just, I love you because I know you're a Christian. I love you because I know you're in church with me every Sunday. No. I have to love you. And I have to love the unlovable. I have to love the unsaved. Because if I just love my son, what about proof? I haven't proven anything. Loving him is easy. All the time. Even, even, even when he's messing up, I still love him. Loving your children is easy. Loving your wife is easy. It, it's, it's, loving, it's loving the murder. Loving the rapists. Loving the atheists. Loving the homeless. Loving the thief. Loving the abusive cop. It's loving those who you don't think deserve it. Because when you see that you got the salvation that you didn't deserve, it becomes a little easier. See, when you understand, I, you know, I didn't deserve it in the first place. When you, when you get that, when you get that down in your spirit, I didn't deserve it. You know, because I'm going to tell you something. Outside of Christ, Jerry was messed up. I was a bad man. In every, uh, in every measurable category. But yet, God saw me worthy. And he made me righteous because I received him. If you catch this and really process this in your spirit, then you'll see that, you know, even though I don't think they deserve my love, I don't think they deserve my attention, I don't think they deserve my compassion, I don't think they deserve my empathy, that yet and still I must give it and give it freely. You know, uh, one, of the, one of my favorite books is called The Kingdom Focus Church by Gene Mills. And if you've never read it, I highly recommend that you do. Um, but in The Kingdom Focus Church, Pastor Mims called the unsaved, he calls them pre-Christians. In other words, that everybody is a Christian waiting to have uh, Gene Mims, Pastor Gene Mims. It's called The Kingdom Focus Church. That book changed, changed my life change how I see ministry. And it's not just for pastors, it's anybody. If you want to know what Kingdom Focus Church looks like, then that, that's the book. But, you know, I love this, like John chapter 3, verse 16, and we know John 3, 16. Everybody knows that. But, it, it, you know, you, you have to dig a little deeper. You have to dig a little deeper because there's a little bit more to that that I think we miss. And let me just read it. And I'm going to read uh, 316 through 318. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten son 
so that whoever believes in him, trusts in him, clings to him, relies on him, shall not perish, that is, come to destruction or be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. That's good news. That's real good news. But as they say in the infomercials, wait, there's more. Verse 17. For God did not send the Son in the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. So in other words, God so loved the world, that is, everybody, you know, and I, I, I get this all the time, people say, oh, they, you, you know, he's, he's in the, uh, the world, he's, he's, he's not talking about the cosmos, the, the, the entire um, you know, the world, he's talking about the elect, and I'm like, you know, God, help me, Jesus. No. It's the world. The world. Everybody. Everybody. Okay. Verse 18. He who believes in him, who clings to, trusts in, relies on him, is not judged. He who trusts in him never comes up for judgment, for in him for in him there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no damnation. But he who does not believe, pleads to rely on or trust in him, is judged already. He has already been convicted and received a sentence because he is not believed in and trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Christ's name. So God didn't come to judge the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. But when he sent Jesus in the world, he drew a line in the sand. And he said, if you receive him, you're good. If you don't, you're convicted by your own. You know, in other words, God is not raining down judgment like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's not going to flood the earth. He's not going to do all these things that people say that, you know, that, you know, uh, you know God is about to rain down on, on San Francisco like Sodom and Gomorrah. No. Sorry. Not going to happen. You know, Isaiah 55, 53 and 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. In other words, the chastisement of our peace upon him, the woman that we should have took for the, for the wrong that we did, Jesus took it so we didn't have to. He paid the price so that we didn't have to. Now all we have to do is believe and receive that he did, rest in the finished work, or you're outside of that. And if you're outside of that, then you're already, the, the world has already been judged and already, already been condemned. The sentence has been passed and the, and, the, and the sentence has been executed. But now, God has set a, 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 play, a thing in motion where we can, go, we can be reconciled unto him by his son. But everyone who's outside of that, they're lost. That's why evangelism is so, is so important. That's why we have to go out and reach the lost. That's why we have to go out and talk to people and share Jesus with them. You know... We have to tell people that, Christ, that the life in Christ is not this exclusive country club. Right. You know, well, I'm in. See ya. You know, it's it's inclusive. You know, you need to be like a, like a toothbrush salesman in Times Square. You know, giving away toothbrushes. You know, try my toothbrush. It's better. Try my toothbrush. It's better. Not selling the toothbrush. All you're trying to do is raise awareness about the toothbrush. You know, you, people say, "Well, you got you got to sit down and you got to you got to hammer people down with scripture. You got to hammer them down and you got to pray over them. And you got no. You don't have to do that. All you got to do is say, "Hey, want to try my Jesus? Want to try my Jesus? You know, my Jesus is good. Just try it. Not, you, don't take my word for it. Just try it for yourself. Try it for yourself. You know, He's good." You don't have to, you don't have to, listen, God is God all by himself. All by himself, he's God. God don't need you to be a salesman for him. It says the, 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 the glory of the earth, or the earth declares his glory. The entire universe declares his glory. I, I, I don't have to make a pitch for God. All I have to say, you know, you try, try, just try, taste and see. 
He's good. You know, what we need to do is we need to like look behind, beyond ourselves. You know, it's, it's easy to, you know, to go out and talk to, minister to black people when you're a black person. It's easy. Not most of the time. <laughs> we got one, one, one disagreement here. But, but, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that when, you know, it, it, it's, it's more difficult to go out and try to, you know, to if you're if, if you're uh, if you're a white person to try to go out and witness to Asians, or a black person trying to witness to white people, or a white person trying, you know, whatever. I insert your ethnicity here. It's not always easy, okay. And it's not easy to talk to people who are homeless when you have a comfortable place in the suburbs. It's not easy to witness to wealthy people when you're working a nine to five. But that should never stop us. In fact, we should ask God and look for opportunities to step outside our comfort zone. Lord, take me to some place that's just a little uncomfortable. Take me to something, and, and here's the funny thing, God's got a sense of humor, because when you ask for that, he will take you there. And, 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 and it will be uncomfortable. And it will stretch you, but it will grow you, and you'll be better for it. You know, I've said before that the gateway to any relationship is empathy. If you don't have empathy, if you don't try to understand where someone is coming from, if you don't take a walk in someone else's shoes, you cannot possibly love them. It is absolutely impossible. Love without empathy does not exist. You know, so 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 I, you know, I try to take a um, a walk in the shoes of the homosexual, of the Klansman of the murderer, of the thief, of the homeless vagabond, of the pimp, of the hustler. I try to walk in their shoes. I'm not saying that I'm trying to do what they do, but I want to understand. Because if I don't understand them, I can't effectively minister to them. And, 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 and the reason why I can't effectively minister to them is because I'm not loving them. You can't minister to anybody if you don't love them. I'm sorry. I mean, not just not just them, but I mean, it's it's, it's anybody. Yeah. It's anybody. If you if you don't if you don't love you if you don't love, you'll operate in judgment. If you're operating in judgment, you I'm, I'm sorry, but you just can't do anything. And it's not our job to judge, but we need to we need to look and say, you know, ask. How can I help? I mean, that, that should be one of the first things on our minds as we wake up and get ready to hit the ground running in our daily lives is how can I help somebody today? How can I be a blessing to someone? So again, to, to recap, um, if, you, if you get your thoughts right about God, then you'll start getting your thoughts right about you. And if you get your thoughts right about you, then you'll get your thoughts right about others. This is the fulfillment of what Jesus said. What is the, when, when the Pharisee asked him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He said, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he said, the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. See, people miss that as yourself part. You know, it's like, Love God, love others. Love God, love others. No, it, it, you can't love anybody else if you don't love you. And I'm going to tell y'all something. I love me some me. <laughs> I'm just, I'll be honest. I do. And, and, that, and that helps me to love others. It helps me to, to be empathic because, because I want someone to understand me. I want someone to take a walk in my shoes. I want someone to see where I'm coming from. I want that. And, and, and frankly, we need that. 
You know, thoughts, everything originates with a thought. The benches that you're sitting on originated with a thought in someone's mind. This building originated with a thought in someone's mind. Um, we began as a thought in someone's mind, and everything began with a thought on God's mind. Everything begins with a thought. So if you get your thoughts lined up right, <coughs> then you start getting the benefits of the cascading effects of that. Because your thoughts will determine your words. Your words will establish your actions. Your actions will establish your habits. Your habits will establish your character. And your character will set your destiny. But it all begins with a single thought. 